A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello and welcome to FDH Lounge mini episode number 11. This is Rick Morris here today with my fellow FDH Lounge dignitary Jake Digman, who is giving us his thoughts on current matters in MMA, pro wrestling, and politics. You and I discussed about uh, the GSP fight that's coming up here, but uh, what, what are some of the, the, the big headlines near term in the world of MMA as you see them here in the in the fall of 2011, what are some of the most important things coming up? I think the biggest fight that's coming up uh, in MMA is uh, the heavy UFC heavyweight title fight. It's going to be a broadcast on uh, broadcast television on Fox. Yeah, for free. They got. The, the, I mean, that's the biggest fight I ever, ever. The UFC heavyweight title is going to be on the line on Fox Television, broadcast television. It's, we've reached that point where mixed martial arts is now being broadcast live on broadcast TV. Ten years ago, nobody would have ever imagined that that being the case. Right. And we've finally reached a point where that is the case, and they're going to be doing a lot more specials on this. And um, the, the UFC brand is absolutely amazing, the fact that it is branded. When you think of, like, cola, you think Coke. When you think of... Um, one of the best ones when you think of tissues you think of kleenex yeah and when you think of mma you think ufc they have done such an awesome job promoting the sport making the sport what it is so the kane velasquez junior dos santos as far as the awareness of what it means to the sport i don't know if it's going to be the greatest fight of all time but i think that's the one the next big thing that's taking mma to the next level um it's interesting like Having been involved in this business for so long, it is right now it's become a point where like I, I couldn't tell you who's fighting on the UFC undercards unless I know them personally. And I find much more enjoyment out of cheering and rooting for the people that I know to go to the next level. Like I mentioned for uh, Brian Rogers and uh, Donnie Walker's fighting tonight. Stipe Myosik's fighting in the uh, – he started off in Cleveland, Cleveland State wrestler. Uh, he's fighting in the UFC in a couple weeks. You've got uh, Chris Lozano just fought on Bellator last week, and there's a huge Bellator card next week, and with a whole bunch of uh, people that I know are fighting on there. It's really cool to follow and trace those guys and see where they're going uh, and as their careers are moving up to the next level. Um, the big thing going on in the MMA world was the GSP v. Nick Diaz uh, situation. <laughs> All of a sudden, it was like a swap and a reversal. It goes, okay, I'm pulling... <laughs> For those of you who don't know this, Gia, Nick Diaz got pulled from the highly promoted main event against GSP because he flat out refused to go to the press conference, which sounds exactly like something Nick Diaz would do. So in turn, they go, okay, they pull him out, they put Carlos Condit in, which means BJ Penn now has no opponent. So like, well, we're gonna who gonna get to fight BJ Penn? All of a sudden, boom! Nick Diaz is free. So they literally did. They pulled like a WrestleMania eight and did a swap out <laughs> and took, put uh, Diaz against uh, uh, BJ Penn, and they got GSP against Carlos Condit. And kind of like you know one of those things. I'm like, that's a bit of a swerve there. So now it's gonna boil down to okay, you pulled. Diaz out of the main event because he refused to do the promotional work, which you should have known you were getting that when you got Nick Diaz. And, okay, let's go with Diaz wins and GSP wins. Are we right back where we started again? This is the whole thing just going to be one giant circle, which I got a feeling. I mean, I think the UFC wanted to test the waters with him to see, uh, you know, if he's really ready to hang with GSP or not. Because if he can't get by BJ Penn, he's sure not going to get by GSP. So I think it's one of those situations that, personally, I look for, more forward to a BJ Penn v. Nick Diaz fight. That looks like a lot more fun to me to watch. It could be interesting, yeah. Although, Nick Diaz, GSP, the one thing about that is, if you got Diaz on the one side and St. Pierre on the other side, as, as, as we mix our wrestling metaphors in and out, is there a better face-heel dynamic anywhere than that one? I mean, that's pretty clear-cut, you know, yeah, who's on what side of what the line. Is it, though? Because at this point, I would think Nick Diaz would be the baby face. He's got more of the, you is know. He like Kevin Nash, NWO? Is that what no, you're saying? No, he'd be more like Stone Cold Steve Austin in 1997. Okay. He's got that rebel, he's got that rebelness to him. That and the fact that I know a lot of people are like, GSP's fights, quite frankly, are b been boring the past couple fights he's had. He, uh, are I we mean, getting I've like heard... a Bob Backlund backlash here? <laughs> kind of, absolutely. I mean, okay. uh, kind of the same thing that's happened with Anderson's 
Silva, too, for a while there. GSP, I mean, he literally just grinds out the five-round decisions, and uh, I've heard a lot of people say he's not fighting to win, he's just fighting not to lose. And usually that leads to very boring fights, and GSP is a very exciting fighter. But at the same time, like, I got a feeling it's this fight coming up, it's going to be GSP grinding out a five-round decision against Carlos Condit. And the MMA fans can be quite, I don't want to say fickle, but they, they can be to the point where, like, if, they see something like this happening, they'll boo. And they'll boo the heck out of it. And then GSP, up on the, I'd like to apologize. I'm sorry that I was not more entertaining. That was my awful GSP impression. <laughs> By the way, <laughs> I'm teasing this. I'm going to get this up on uh, you, YouTube uh, sometime soon here and also on our blog. As we've been getting up our classic lounge segments, it's just a matter of, of, of taking the audio and, 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 and mixing things in to get them on there. One of the things that we're going to be putting up in the near future is our Pro Wrestling Archetypes for MMA segment that you and I did with Kyle Ross some oh, months yeah. ago. And as I was just re-listening to that the other day, your whole thing about GSP with the whole failed uh, heel turn the one time, you know, I was, oh, was very hor- impressed yeah, with It was your- so <laughs> horrible. I mean, he came out there, and tried, they tried to turn him heel at that point, and no one was ready to like go heel on him. I mean, the crowd was obviously still been like, he, I was not that impressed with your performance. And he comes back the next day, I was like, I am so sorry I said that. <laughs> I was like, you could tell you like some kind of like, you know, go out there. I mean, they having worked in the business, they don't, you know, they don't tell you what to say, but it's kind of like, hey, you know, go out there and, you know, make things interesting. So, I mean, I think one of the best post-fight interviews ever was Mark Coleman after he lost to Randy Couture. And he's in the middle of, you know, Mark Coleman, UFC legend, UFC Hall of Famer. I've met Mark several times. Um, he, he looks over and Tito Ortiz is talking trash cage side. And it's like, they're asking Joe Rogan's asking him about, like, you know, how was your uh, performance? Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts? Are you going to be in the octagon? And all of a sudden, he's like, hey, F you, Tito. Get in here and fight me right now if you want to do it. No, F you. And it's just <laughs> going off. It's like, it's like, God love you, Mark Coleman. If nothing else, it was entertaining to the, the end of it to that, see what happened. That is that is great stuff. Uh, to hook back around to the first thing you brought up about MMA here uh, uh, on the fall slate of, of events and things we got going on, that heavyweight title fight that's coming up on Fox. Now, as I shamelessly name drop here, past lounge guest Dave Meltzer. I've seen that he has mentioned uh, some, some not exactly concern, but a little bit of a sense of there's going to be a balancing act going forward because how many true marquee fights are there out there for UFC? So you, you have two masters now that you have to serve. You have to keep the buy rates pumped up. you got to make sure 12 times a year uh, that, that you're pushing out enough things here that are going to make people want to buy it. Then again, what are you going to have left over for Fox? They're putting a pretty big pay-per-view worthy fight on Fox. That's going to be fascinating to monitor as we go along how they're going to work that balance. Well, I think they've got enough marquee fights to last them forever. Um, if you look at it, they're actually doing things the right way because they're actually doing the the invasion angle since they do now own Strike Force right. also. Um, you got enough there where you keep to the, they're they're doing a real brand extension how it should be, and they get enough dream fights there with you know. Um, guys that are fighting in strike force that can do crossover fights like Dan Henderson mentioned he would like to uh, fight in strike force and go fight in the UFC and it's nice that it could be the point where they can have that the one thing where the UFC I, I have to give them again they get the utmost credit for is through the power of we've seen with the ultimate fighter and different things and these specials on Fox and whatnot and uh the, just the undercards of their shows, they're very good at creating new stars. Mm-hmm. They've We've seen, like, the entire featherweight division now is all of a sudden, anybody under the lightweight division, the featherweight, the bantamweight division, two years ago in the WEC, yeah, they were known by the hardcore MMA purists, but now you have people walk around who know who Dominic Cruz is. They know who Uriah Faber is. Your MMA marks, per se, are getting familiar with them, and the UFC is doing a great job of branding their stars like that and we're seeing the older generation of fighters slowly start to fade into the background your, your names the, the guys that were really the pioneers of the modern mma as we know it um we had the first generation you know with your uh, your ken shamrock your hoist gracie stuff like that and then we've got this generation of uh i, I guess you could call it the mma boom period after the spike tv the ultimate fighter the names that um, Chuck Liddell is your Randy Couture is your Rich Franklin's. We're starting uh, to see those guys take steps back as they're getting later into their fight career. And the new the new stars that like Diego Sanchez that was established on uh, the Ultimate Fighter, so guys like that like Forrest Griffin and international performers as well that are coming over here 
and making names for themselves. Guys, uh, Anderson Silva is a prime example of that. Someone who was fighting over in Pride all of a sudden came back over and became the biggest star in MMA, quite frankly, arguably pound for pound, the best fighter in the world right now. And it's it's just a very good job of how they brand themselves where I don't think we're ever going to have a shortage of the big fight. I mean, they're still sitting on GSP v. Anderson Silva. That thing would be mm-hmm. huge. Um, if they've got Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar. Brock is money. Brock draws. People people want to see Brock Lesnar fight. He's one of those guys that either you like him or you want to see him get his ass kicked. Either way, you're going to watch Brock fight. And Brock brings in over a million pay-per-view buys every single time he's out there. And if he's, if he's ever going to be really down to clown ever again, I think this next fight is going to tell the tale on that. Yeah, there's, this there's is some gonna, sense he may be coming back a little early. I mean, this is going to be the thing with Brock Lesnar. We're going to find out for sure if this is... Uh, he was one of those things where his name was his greatest blessing and his mm-hmm. greatest curse. Brock Lesnar didn't have the uh, the luxury that a lot of fighters have. Where, you know, you start off on, on a, an indie circuit as an amateur and you work your way up through. No, he fought one fight in K1 Heroes and then bam, he was thrown in the UFC. He was in the, he had a UFC heavyweight He was the UFC heavyweight champion four fights into his mixed martial arts career, which it's a lot of people, and it's only because he's Brock Lesnar. Mm-hmm. That's the only reason why. There's a lot of guys out there that see that and are like very resentful. And you know what? I think it puts three times the uh, heck 20 times the pressure on to brock but brock has stepped up and he delivered in situations and coming off his last performance uh where he lost the title we're gonna see you know is brock the real deal uh, can he learn from this is he gonna come back or i mean i think it'd be one of those things where we're always gonna see him involved in the sport somehow be just because his mm-hmm. he's he's a wrestling guy. He knows how to talk into a microphone. He knows how to cut a promo. He knows how to cut a promo to get asses into seats. He knows how to do that. So it will come. I, I think we're going to see him as being one of those ambassadors for the sport of mixed martial arts. Yeah, that'll probably uh, go on uh, even well, like you said, well past uh, his his fighting career. Uh, segwaying logically here to uh, to pro wrestling, which I want to ask you about as well. Yes. Uh, uh, we, we, we have we teased that a few times here, uh, getting into that a little bit. You mentioned before, I'm going to go all the way back to when you were talking about the summer of punk. Ah, uh, yes. Yes. So that was a that was a key part of what uh, Kyle Ross and I were uh, getting into when we were uh, doing our uh, most recent uh, FDH Lounge mini episode here. We were doing a lot of talk, uh, Kyle's thoughts on the philosophy of booking pro wrestling and everything. He is very much a pessimist on what's happening there. Now, you and I yeah. are sitting here on the verge of Night of Champions tomorrow night, so whatever you and I speculate right now is going to be dated as of whatever happens Sunday evening here. But I can't say that I have a real good feeling about it the way that it's going here. What are your thoughts on that angle and what they've done with it since it got to be red hot at the end of June to where we are right now? It's one of those things where it's it needs to move forward. And it, something needs to happen, and it needs to, to move forward with it. The, my thing is, okay, why are, obviously, you know, the smarks are going off, like, they're doing this too early, why are they wrestling, why are they doing this now? They should have waited until WrestleMania and all this stuff. Quite frankly, I, I think it's a, a good idea to do it now. And uh, I've read several different things. People talk about the, I believe the stipulation is that if the if uh, the game loses, he's no longer cuckoo or whatever. <laughs> so um, He's not cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs anymore. But, I mean, <laughs> I, I like the idea of with, you know, him, like, Johnny Ace screwing CM, or not CM Punk, screwing Triple H out to get him out as the COO. And people are like, why would they just bring him in to get him out? They do this crap all the time. Like, they bring in guys that are, they brought in, uh, Bret Hart was the GM for like two weeks. All of a sudden, the anonymous general manager just disappeared. <laughs> it was never seen again. It was, he's, he's hanging out with the guy who raised the briefcase. They, they've still got the platform out there every week, which is yeah. interesting. So, which means it reminds you that he still exists, so he's probably right. going to come back, and I mean, who knows who that could be. But personally, I'm one of those things where I, I look at Night of Champions, and it's the next phase. I like the fact that they got Kevin Nash out of this, just because of Kevin Nash made no sense at all in the storyline. He's probably brought right back into it again on Sunday. I have no idea. It just I like the element of what they do with like uh, um, CM Punk being the you know, you, you, the guy basically you held me back kind of. It's like Shane Douglas, Ric Flair, in the right? 90s. You held me back, and 
the story almost dictates, you know, CM Punk needs to win in order to not be squashed. But at the same time, I can also see someone screwing CM Punk over and Hunter retaining and staying there. The problem is it's on the, the main card of everything. It's all the exact same thing. It never changes. It's right back to, like, John Cena versus Alberto Del Rio. Alberto Del Rio is going to cheat and win and sneak out barely the champion still. And yeah. it's, it's, it's really just – it's one of those things where you kind of got hurt on is everything is just holding – water until wrestlemania where i mean it's Dwayne and john that's what everybody wants to see uh and i think once this gets out of the way like survivor series the rock is coming back to team with cena i read that today um i like that idea i like where they're going with that and you know maybe throw a cm punk on that team that'd be kind of fascinating like the angle that i want to see and i think a lot of people want to see and they've teased about it and if they want this to be the biggest wrestlemania ever there's three big dream matches that I was thinking of because it's the point now where you got to sell uh, you got to sell on the dream match for the show. Right. Obviously, you got you, you got the Rock and John Cena as your one. Stone Cold Steve Austin v CM Punk is the yes. other one, and they've teased and they've talked about it. And I think after doing Tough Enough, and you see like stuff that Austin's been doing. He's dropped more than one hint out there that says, like, you know, hey, um, I would come back to work with us. And the story is tailor-made for itself. The fact, you know, some people will side with CM Punk. Some people will side with Stone Cold Steve Austin. You've got the fact that, I mean, just the promo work itself on that could be absolutely incredible. CM Punk cutting promos about how he admired Austin, but how Austin led an entire generation to alcoholism <laughs> could be absolutely amazing. And Austin being like, you know, I don't, I came back because I don't want it to leave it to punks like you who don't appreciate this business like you want to do is whine a bitch and complain do something about it mm-hmm. uh the, the st- uh, I, pro wrestling is what it is it should be entertaining it shouldn't be the same that's a, that's why i was always as a kid i was always a fan of the nwa in the 80s i was always a fan of the jim crockett promotions me too i was a horseman fan i never liked the wwf because it was always the same thing hulk hogan gets beat up by a fat guy he body slams him leg drops him and pins him and then cheers and poses right it was this like i liked m- the when the, the macho man had his run because a big fan of him and Liz. I thought that was pretty cool, and especially like I remember, I remember even as a kid watching when him and uh, Hogan feuded they, the WrestleMania five. I sided with the Macho Man because I thought he was absolutely right. I'm like, dude, he left his tag team partner. I remember watching as a kid, like he just left him. He got my my. Uh, my dad or my uncle's like, but he's got to go take care of his manager. I'm like, that's why they have doctors. He just deserted him. Yeah. He got his butt kicked. I'd be ticked, too. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was perfectly. Uh, With 600 pounds in the ring there. Uh, yeah, you, you know, know leaving him behind. Perfectly, like, just justified even as a kid watching it. But back to Night of Champions, I mean, it's been a lot of fun watching. And the fact that, you know, CM Punk got the chance to go out there and just be himself and cut an absolutely incredible promo. And I can relate to a guy who just says what he thinks about what's going on at a certain situation. If something's bullshit, he called it out as being bullshit, and I respect that. I, I think the world needs more people like that. Uh, we need more people that, um, which may, may also segue into your political discussion you are talking about earlier, we need people who are, are don't go with the cookie-cutter mold of, like, this is what it is, this is what you're supposed to do, get in line, robotic state of being. And unfortunately, even uh, pro wrestling being a microcosm of society itself, everything is was cookie cutter right in line and yeah it was this was an absolutely hot angle and there was so many other things i they could have should have done with it i mean i thought they brought him back way too fast um i thought the fact that he i i i, lo- I loved reading the things online and people talking but the, the thing of the power of this angle that it had that it got people who didn't watch wrestling were all of a sudden going wow like jim rome was like talking about you know what cm punk did jim rome who the fact that it hit such – people bought it. People bought into it. It's very hard to get people to suspend uh, their suspend their belief because everybody knows uh, what r- wrestling is now. But you had mainstream media outlets saying stuff like, you know, holy crap, this is happening. And then he actually wins the title and, quote, unquote, leaves the company. And it's like there's so many different things they could have – routes that you could have gone with that instead of like the, the – I think the problem is, and an old friend of ours is hearing this. I, 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 no offense, buddy, but they don't have any balls. The they're little f- guy, yeah, yeah. They're afraid to take chances. They don't. They don't take any. I mean, you don't have a, an an NWO risk anymore. You know, right. something like that was just like you know, watching. I go, holy crap, is this happening? And the CM Punk shoot promo made people say, holy crap, is this happening? And the fact that he mentions all these other promotions, I mean. 
they need to realize that Vince McMahon, especially that the Ring of Honor and hell, even TNA is not their competition. It's everything else is their competition. The whole industry, like how much more fun would it have been if CM Punk really showed up to the Ring of Honor show, first TV tapings with the WWE Championship? Yep. All it's going to do is benefit both companies and benefit you know fans as a whole and get people talking like, no man, he showed up here with this and be one of those things where you know, hey, here I am, kind of I left, came back as a conquering hero, and I read some <laughs> one of the. No, no offense to people, like the dumbest things I read, like you know, John Cena should have got fired too and chased him in the Ring of Honor shows. Like, yeah, right. Like they're really gonna, <laughs> like they're gonna send which John Cena in an ROH show would have been pretty funny though. That would have been. <laughs> been like the the ECW one night stand crowd times like a million. He doesn't but, want any more of East Coast indie fan. Let me tell you. <laughs> you know what though? Here's the thing with Cena. Cena's really really good. Like Cena actually has earned his spot of what he's doing and where he's at. And people like you know. All your smart marks hate on John Cena and talk like Cena. Cena does. Cena's a really good. He's he's talented at what he does. He's had like uh, if we're going to use these smart mark star ratings. I mean, he's had like four star matches with a variety of different. I mean, he drug like a three and a half star match out of the Great Kali. <laughs> that, True. I, it's, Umaga you know, had some good matches with him. Uh, he's had. He can work, and he doesn't get credit enough credit for what he can do. Like John Cena was very much a, a part of this whole CM Punk thing, as like the match they had. That was awesome. The, the atmosphere of the one they had in Chicago, where Punk won the title, mm-hmm. that was absolutely awesome. That was you know it was fun to watch. Problem is now it goes back to the same old crap. It does. It really does. Now, having <laughs> said that, if we do have a situation where uh, John Laurinaitis slash John, Johnny Ace jo- Johnny Ace slash John Laryngitis slash Marty <laughs> Funkhauser whatever whatever we want John Laryngitis yeah. never heard that yeah slash uh, Mrs. Baba's young boy Mrs. Baba's yeah exa- yeah yeah her young boy slash Marty Funkhauser is probably my favorite the guy who first started dropping that was uh, that the person who came with that was my hero I read that somewhere on the internet but if they <laughs> if they have him interfere guess what he needs to hit Triple H with what a sledgehammer be- no. No, what would be the greatest smart mark reference for Johnny Ace to hit uh, Triple H with? <laughs> a surfboard, a or skateboard. A skateboard, <laughs> yes, that's what he's. That would do. rock. That would be the greatest. That, thing that ever. would that would actually be entertaining. See, that's the funny thing is, I was talking to a friend of mine about this before. I'm at the point now where I watch uh, like if, if I'm if I catch uh, wrestling on TV, I am. I want stuff that will just entertain me that right. only I would find amusing, <laughs> and I don't care if everybody else finds it amusing, like. I, the, one of the things I thought was funny was the Austin heel turn to the Alliance. Back yeah. in, it made no sense. It was dumb, and it flushed a lot of money down the drain. But I'm like, I thought it would be really funny if the reason why he turns heels is because they didn't hug him. And I'll be damned <laughs> if that's not the reason why. they. It was the stupidest possible reason I could think of. I was there at the invasion. <laughs> so I was saw I. the boom end with my own two eyes when that happened. Yeah. That was the end of it. I remember was... watching out going, like, we were all cheering and going, ha, we just successfully killed the entire wrestling boom. Yeah, <laughs> was yeah. Like, that was that – was, that was such a horrible it, show. It, it, it evaporated, <laughs> it was. It, it evaporated <laughs> right before our eyes. It was like, you know, poof, it's gone. Yeah, it's like, yeah that was uh, you, that was pretty much the end of it. Well, as far as amusing uh, people and amusing yourselves, it, it always goes to a thing where uh, Kyle always used to say on the old SNS, there's three people laughing right now and two of them are in studio. Yes. And he would always be referring to the one of us that was at home listening. You know? <laughs> so, that was always uh, something Can I, I work for you wrong. I believed in. Yeah, that's that's a concept I believe in uh, to this day. Uh, they should he, let us book our own little wrestling promotion. We should like call an old friend and be like, dude, just give us a range for like two weeks. I guarantee it'll be a lot of fun. Like, you're putting the world title on Yoshi Tatsu. But like, yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody would see it coming. That might be great. Better than Tank Abbott. Or, but, or, or quite frankly, and this is as far as I'm going to go on this inside thing, uh, giving the little guy carte blanche would make our lives a lot happier as well. But that's yeah. uh, that's well, speaking of the, the uh, on, on that uh, on the topic though of uh, with wrestling, how is TNA so bad? It could be so good, but it's so bad. It's like uh, almost like to the point where it's like they're trying to make it that bad. It's like I don't know if you heard a chance to hear when uh, Paul Heyman was discussing uh, his thoughts and, like, what he would have done with TNA and mm-hmm. how he focused on the young guys. And he brought up a valid point. He goes, you're, you're building up these guys where, where, as you're watching it, you want to watch next week to see where they go, what happens. And TNA just all these old guys like Sting and Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan. 
they're not going to do anything different next week. No. So it's like I don't really want – like I've got no desire to ever see 66-year-old Ric Flair bleeding all over my TV. I mean it sucks, you know, your personal problems. But at the end of the day, it's like it's just so bad. And they have such an awesome crop of talent that it could be really, really good. Like if they literally – if they just follow the, the – uh, a combination of like the Ring of Honor um, style, where they should go out there and have good wrestling matches. Don't try to be the WWE. You never will be. And the people who are watching are watching because they don't want to watch the other one. They're aware that it exists. I, I would love to find a person. I'd love to find a person who's a TNA mark that has no idea that WWE exists. I don't think that's the case. I don't think there's one single person no. out there that the TNA fan that isn't aware that the WWE exists. And it's just like you know. I, w- I watch it, and I'm like, I can't watch it. I, I literally can't. There's certain stuff on there. It's like, why is this happening? Like, the, the, their immortal NWO group. Like, every single guy that has been feuding with each other has gone in and out of that damn little yeah. group. And now you bring Jeff Hardy back, who it's like, okay, I get that's cool. But also, it's I, I it, it's just frustrating it, it could be so much better, and it's right. not. It's just annoying of how bad it is. It is. It is absolutely horrible. Here's the thing also, too, even with the younger guys that, that, that are any good, it's a thing where I can't take anything they do seriously in that setting, and I'll tell you why. Because as much as I've joked in the past about how they're a tribute promotion to WCW circa really 99 to 01. <laughs> they're what happened if ECW and WCW 99 to 01 had a kid. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. But here's why. I went back and I looked at this one of these times here. Because I always love looking at like alternate booking scenarios for times. You can count on one hand the number of people in the last 18 months of WCW that didn't turn. I mean, it was just everybody... Oh, Everybody yeah. was turning and week to week. So you, you have to have something for the audience to latch its sympathies to. And you couldn't do this if you're supposed to be rooting now for a guy that three months ago you were supposed to hate and three months later you're going to be supposed to be hating again. I think Ken Anderson turned three times in the course of this interview. And this is, this is the thing. <laughs> Even A.J. Styles. A.J. Styles is great. But how many times in desperation over the last seven years plus have they, like, okay, uh, we wanted to get more traction, we're going to turn him again. I mean, just about everybody in that promotion has, so you don't hardly have anybody that has the uninterrupted run the one way or another. Ironically, one of the closest things that you have to that is somebody like Robert Roode, who is a long-term heel who they're now pushing as a face. And ironically, just the fact that he uh, is, is such a recent face, that may give it a little bit more traction in terms of him being a franchise guy. But I don't know that anybody necessarily looks at, at Robert Roode and thinks that that guy's the future of wrestling for the next 10 years. Um, no, not necessarily uh, for the next 10 years, but it is nice to see that, you know, that they're pushing a homegrown talent. And I yes. think he's have a great match with Kurt Angle. And I, I think it's cool that you know it didn't turn out to be the same status quo, that it's somebody different that came out of this whole convoluted um whatever bound for glory series they were doing one person that i do have to give credit to which actually one of my favorite i I never thought i'd be saying this in 2011 bully ray bully ray is on the run of like i would love to see bully ray take that gimmick and go up north with it i think he could actually have like a decent like especially the whole gimmick of being a bully (laughs) It, it, it works and he's in great shape and he's been busting his ass out there performing and it's one of those things of like if you thought if I never imagined I would have given a crap about one half of the Dudley boys in 2011, yeah. but God bless them, you know he's taken full advantage of the opportunity, and hopefully you know they they continue to focus on I I, I can't call him a young guy because he's not at all, but it's fresh. I mean it's not really age. That's the thing. I think it was Triple H who mentioned something about this in an interview once. It's not your actual age; it's your television age. Like Steve Austin, for example, got so old so fast because he was on TV nonstop. Right. John Cena's character is so old; it's like it's it desperately needs a freshen up to it, but it won't get that until all these kids now that are cheering for him become teenagers and they start booing him. Right? It, it's funny you watch wrestling. Wrestling goes in cycles. Everything is a cycle. Everything, it nothing's new. It all repeats itself. The characters, I mean. The John Cena character is the Hulk Hogan character. 
He is the superhero. He's Superman. He's you know overcomes the odds, beats the bad guys, and wins. It's that CM Punk right now has the the rebel. Uh, he's got the the rebel against the company character that we saw uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin make so popular and famous. Right. Uh, Jack Swagger looks like he w- went to the Kurt Angle school of <laughs> of of gimmicks. He's, he's in the early Kurt Angle days though, when yeah. it was a comedy heel and they didn't take him seriously. Yeah, he's enough. got yeah. he's he's got that going on. You've got you know um, I hate to say this, but our truth kind of reminds me a little bit of Booker T. I mean, obviously because they're both black and do the action. See, kick. I'm, I'm I'm thinking Black Pillman. Black Pillman with Archer. I, see, I, yeah, I, kind I, of. I can see that a, a, a little bit. The, uh, you know, what the heck's he gonna, gonna do next? But uh, bottom line is everything. It like Miz Jericho. You know, Miz Rock. Right. I mean, you can compare the 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 two. It everything goes in a cycle, and it all comes back to the very beginning of it. And the question is, I mean, once people pick up on that. What can you do to break that mold? You know, it's like and that's what the CM Punk character did. He broke that mold where it was like, you know, I can't believe that just happened. Right. And then it's a matter of, OK, keeping the momentum going. And like he can't just go on TV every week and be like, you know, you help me now. I'm like, you have your opportunity now. You have it. It's here. You've got it. Make them. They, it, they have to get be, the company has to get behind him and realize the fact that, you know, write stuff that is beneficial to his character. Um, you you would uh, with Stone Cold Steve Austin when he was on top. Everything was written to benefit the Austin character. The point where it got kind of annoying, where it was like, I mean, everything now was written to uh, appease the Cena character. That is what they have to do with the CM Punk, and they got to realize they have to take a risk, and that there's a whole audience out there that is not on the John Cena bandwagon. Right. Those are the people who are watching MMA, quite frankly. Right. That don't that were they're kind of i mean i even the kids there's kids that are like now they're preteen teenagers that are getting on the cm punk bandwagon because he's a rebel and it's proven in the past numbers the data is there rebels draw everybody wants to punch their boss yep. <laughs> rather than okay, hate to go back to rehash that storyline but it works because everybody wants to be that way now if you can the thing is to add a twist where it's something that's a little different, you know, where like Stone Cold Steve Austin was out there and he was drinking beer and he was a total rebel. Um, add a little twist with CM Punk where it's like, you know, he believes his character is 100% in the right and justified with what he's doing, and the people will get behind it. Um, one of the things I think that it lacks in wrestling right now is the dream match. Uh, CM Punk v. John Cena at Money in the Bank was one of those, like a dream match. You had to see you wanted to see what was going to happen in that setting we'd seen it before but not in that setting in that setting i Mm -hmm. mean and and that's the thing too in in wrestling and even mma a rematch can still be a dream match it doesn't have to be their first one-on-one match or it's all about the hype that you can build like uh uh, one of my dream matches right now actually that i was thinking of my third headliner for wrestlemania this year is the undertaker v chris jericho where jericho's thing is the only reason he'd ever have to come back is to break that streak that's the only reason he's done everything else there is to do. So he's back there, and I would actually put up a huge argument for Jericho to break the streak. Because, I mean, uh, let's face facts, the Undertaker isn't going to be around much longer. Right. I mean, he's kind of literally, he literally has to wrestle one match a year. And do you hold off for the Cena money match? I actually kind of, I like the idea of Jericho doing it because Jericho's an established veteran. He's earned the right to do it, and he's going to be around a lot longer, keep himself in great shape. He takes time off, and having something like that, just with the swarminess of his character as the heel that he is, to add that to it, 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 it could be used for years to establish and create new stars yeah. from it. And that's really what you got to do is create new stars. So, that, I mean, I would want to watch that just for the promo build to it alone. The Undertaker and Jericho be like, I'm not afraid of you. And he can sell off the fact that the Undertaker never beat Jericho. That's he true. He never has. So he can use that of like, you've never beaten me, and I'm going to beat you. I'm going to beat you. This is like, I'm not afraid. I, I, I know what this day is, what happens. And to the point where it takes everything under the sun, but he finally does it, and he beats him. And the people wouldn't know what to do no text message that's true they wouldn't know what to do well uh bringing it around uh, as we've been talking about the pro wrestling stuff here that inevitably segues right to uh politics and i wanted to get to this with you politics and wrestling yes yes uh there's a lot of bleed over particularly now that we're into the uh the republican primaries here and as we've talked about previously again i'm not a full-fledged 
Ron Paul guy. I'm sympathetic on a lot of things. You obviously are. You're, you're down with him on just about everything that I can, can see here. I, 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 I'm with him on a lot of stuff. I'm sympathetic with where he's coming from, even when I don't agree with all the conclusions that he draws. But I have to say, I mean, I am outraged in watching some of these uh, debates that are going on now. This stupid playbook that Rudy Giuliani devised in 07, if you're a fake conservative and you want to look like a tough guy, beat up on Ron Paul for being uh, you know, down with our enemies. Now Rick Santorum, he's the latest fake conservative to pick up on that and fan the flames. And Oh, Ron Paul's a member of al-Qaeda. I mean, I can only imagine what a guy like you is thinking when you see that. I was actually unaware that that that, dude, that, that was going on, but okay. thank you for bringing it to my, to bring it to my attention. Okay. My first thought, actually, when you just told me that, I was like, people are idiots. Unfortunately, yeah. the people in this country are idiots, and I, I God love you, but at the same time, it, you look at it and you go, okay, it's playing off of fear. They're right. playing off of a fear campaign to it, and you mentioned, like, I do agree with a lot of stuff Ron Paul says. I'm anti-two-party dictatorship. Right. My whole thing is the only thing that's going to save this country is the two-party system has to go away. I don't even know why we have elected officials. We should just elect lobbyists at this point. I mean, really, they should just go out and say, okay, these are my lobbyists. These are the people who are paying me off. If you want this stuff to be in power, vote for me, because that's really what's happening at this point, and I mean... People are sheep. I hate to say that, but people are sheep, okay? You look at the – we had the eight years of the Republicans uh, in power and everything that went on there. And all these people were so up in arms and screaming and yelling, like, you know, we need to get – which led to the, one of the greatest promo campaigns ever of change. Yes, we can. It worked so great on so many levels because, obviously, you know, Democrat, Republican to Democrat, the first black president. I mean, it, it hit – a core nerve with people but it came about and it's still the same thing as a people I, I, that it, one thing that ron paul speaks about that he's open about is the fact of the you know fighting the federal reserve and the fact that you know us over in certain places is what causes a lot of stuff for problems for america we have our hands and so if you look at the history of like the dirty deeds that we've done deals with the devil it's really disgusting, and it's like I am i am very much a um, – not an isolationist, but I, I don't see the point in going around, like, bullying everybody and fighting around the world. I don't see the point – I don't believe in, in on either side of this of – like Israel Palestine. I don't I don't why are you fighting? What are you what are you hoping to gain? Okay, let's say you wipe out the other then what do you gain? What are you trying to get? I don't I don't understand that. I think we need to grow as a country. We need to focus more on this is where the libertarian side of me comes in. We need to focus more on the local and build things up from there. And the problem is we focus everything on a national and trickle it down. But without you, you can't put a roof on a house to start building a house. You don't start off with the roof. You start off with the basement and the foundation of the, with the, of the property. And if you look at uh, America, quite frankly, a lot of our foundations are cracked. Right. Yeah, and there's, there's, there's a lot of weakness there, no question. The, the, the tag I use for myself on foreign affairs, I, I, I say for myself, common sense, non-interventionist. I'm not, I agree. I'm not a pacifist. I believe there are circumstances where you got to do stuff. Yeah, you but, kick yeah. over. You kick over my bucket of my bucket of water. I'm going to come kick your bucket of water yeah. over. But at the same exactly. time, you know, yeah. Don't go looking for problems. Is kind of my thing. So to whatever extent, I think Ron Paul maybe takes that a little bit further than I do. But I, I'm sympathetic with his general direction on stuff, and it is infuriating with see, me to see that the problem that ron paul has is he's against his the establishments of his own party uh, right. like he's, he's totally he's against the whole lobbyist thing he's against the fact of what our country has become he wants to bring it back to what our founding fathers wanted which i agree with i don't think there should be i don't think we should have career politicians i i, I think it should be the people go in and serve whomever it happens to be i don't think that we should have career politicians who are all on the take. I, I hate to say that, but it's true. You can look at anything. If you can find me not one that's not on the take, and Ron Paul's probably on the take from somebody too. Uh, I mean, not that it's a bad thing, but every single he's gotten a little bit of pork, yeah. so his hands are not completely clean. Yeah, but, I mean, he's every good. single one of them is on the take from somebody, and it's just you get to the point where you know the only thing that could ever work. Uh, I was trying to think of scenarios where we could have a third party candidate win like the let's call it the presidency uh, we've seen third party candidates win governors but uh, what would it take in today's day and age 
It would take, number one, they'd have to be in the debates. They'd have to be able to speak on the national debates. And right. It would have to be a celebrity. It would have to be a celebrity that everybody respects because we are a celebrity-driven society. Celebrities are the, the modern gods of the society that we live in. Mm-hmm. What we've created, they are, they are the, the, as the ancient Greeks had their gods on uh, um, Mount Olympus, we have our gods and goddesses in the Hollywood Hills. That's just how things are that's especially with now with youtube and with uh, the huge uh, wave of social media it would have to be somebody that everybody could listen to that would get behind and would support that would get young people out to vote to say hey i'm like look at look at the governor all right arnold schwarzenegger right. was the governor of california right all right jesse ventura who was an actual politician right. became the governor of minnesota sonny bono was uh, a, in, the, in the senate i believe yeah uh, steve largent also in the senate i mean bill bradley was a big time nba player yeah so you know i mean we ronald reagan yeah. was the president of the united states he was an actor it's to the point now where i i think we need it would need to be somebody that the people could get behind that has to have, you know, and they have to have money. That's the thing. They have to be able to have enough money. And I'm not talking about Donald Trump, who's just a character and a half. And they have to be somebody that's respectable with money. And I'm, like, just throwing a name off the top of my head. I have no idea if they'd ever want to do something like this. But somebody like a Morgan Freeman, somebody that, that people could listen to, um, like, obviously I don't know what his political ties are with anything, but somebody like, you know, that it'd have to cross many different fields. You know, it couldn't be like, you know, a a porn star. It couldn't be a Brett Michaels. It could be, it'd have to be somebody who's well respected that doesn't have, and like Tom Hanks is actually somebody I've never seen any scandals about Tom Hanks. Mm -hmm. You know, it'd have to be somebody like that. What about Peyton Manning? What about Peyton Manning? Well, I mean, it just comes to mind. All American kind of guy, kind of yeah, <laughs> little know. young, but uh, um, yeah, why not? Why not? What about uh, what about? Uh, I was gonna Eli? say Brady, and then I'm like, ah, it's what right. Brett Favre. He's uh, he's pretty well respected. Yeah. Right? There's a guy. There's another one. By the way, how about going from like, being super respected? He, there's the Ric Flair of the NFL, Brett Favre. That's true. I, you know, <laughs> yeah. When, when is Grantland gonna run their Brett Favre expose like they did for Ric Flair, which which was classic? Yeah, that was, uh, was kind of by by classic. You mean depressing as hell? It was. It was. I read that. And I was like, oh. You do realize that Ric Flair is gonna like die naching one day. Yeah, like, probably. Ric Flair lives every day like it's his last. He's going to end up dying nature. Let's put Ric Flair. Why not? It'd be great you know, promos. To, 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 <laughs> yeah, hey, to Ric Flair, there could be no better way than to go out spending your last dollar and leaving immense debt to your family. The, to Ric Flair, is there any better uh, way to operate in life? There, there, there's a, there would be a heck of a, a uh, political duo right there. You know, the, the independent libertarian candidacy of Ron Paul and nature boy Ric Flair. And to think that Ric Flair, yeah. <laughs> Rick Flair, back in the 80s, when he started getting involved in Republican politics in North Carolina, there was some talk that he might uh, someday be a candidate for future office. Boy, it's, did that go by the boards as we've you know, gotten. Yeah, it has, but him. also at the same time, it's funny because all politics is a popularity contest. It is. It's a popularity contest and see how much money you got back in you. It's funny, yeah. in like, the 2008 election, I, I was following like who... You can even tell, like, it, the, the fix is in. Because right. you can tell, like, who's backing who. They, it's public public knowledge of uh, who the leading backers, financial donors, mm-hmm. as they are. And, like, you look at stuff like Google. Google donated twice the amount of money to the Democratic uh, campaign than they did the Republican ca- campaign. Right. Um, there was literally, like, almost twice as much money from companies that donated to both were siding on the Democratic side of things. I, I still think the 2008 one was the one where they uh, uh, they – basically took the maverick john mccain they snipped off his uh tatas gave him sarah palin and made him look as dumb as possible they didn't want him to win he wasn't winning that right people thought they had a choice it's it's if you understand human behavior and you watch like psychology especially with uh subliminal advertising Mm -hmm. with everything everything with that he was he was the heel he was made out to be the heel he was representing the heel party that had ran this country into the ground so they put the red team out they put the blue team in and guess what it's the exact same thing because it's still the exact same people doing the exact same crap it's run by the rich people for the corporations um one of the things i heard a friend of mine say and i absolutely agree with him on we're all slaves we just don't realize it anybody who has mm-hmm. a mortgage you have a car payment you have to go to your job you're a slave you just get paid for it yep that's true 
That's absolutely or indentured servants. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. That's the reality of life these days, and it's a thing where that 2008 campaign, and, and, and again, and part of it comes from my political perspective. But I was so embittered by by so much that went on because, as you said, the fix wasn't, and it was a thing here. What what people were people were celebrating the whole thing of you know like the Obama image and the multicolor image on the T-shirts and stuff. That kind of iconography made me violently angry like we're we're electing a president because some dipstick thinks that the guy's got a cool t-shirt i mean if if anything has ever better you know is summed up the decline and fall of western civilization it was that it was the bases that people had in their head for voting for this guy it, it just it was so depressing to me it was it was well promoted it was d- done in a way where it was i mean it was it's no longer about who the best candidate was right because I mean, he had four years barack obama had absolutely no experience right did not have even been considered for that position illinois state but he could Senate talk until uh, the end of 04 he could cut a promo that's yeah. all it was he could cut a promo and you know what it fit it, it they, it fit the niche marketing campaign because it got so many inner city people to come out and vote. I'm not just going to say black. It got inner city people to come out and vote right. that never would have normally voted as a result of uh, him being who he is. And the funny thing is uh, they, they came out, they voted in droves, and they didn't realize it's the exact right. same thing. I don't know if they thought like Barack Obama was going to get in office all of a sudden and be like, you know, hey, no more projects. Everyone now is loaded and ready. You know, everyone's going to have a job. And whoever won that was going to be stuck in a situation where it was a la- my, my buddy Evan said this. Whoever won in 2008 was going to be a lame duck president because they're, they're, essentially they inherited a pile mm-hmm. of crap. Yeah. They had a gigantic pile of crap. And there's, I've said this before. Unfortunately, I believe that we're to the point now where the society needs a full-on economic collapse in order to rebuild itself and crawl back up. Because, I mean, money doesn't go away. Money's like matter. Right. It's all being hoarded by the top 2% is hoarding 98% of the money. It's like, what are you going to do with it? You know, you don't realize if you're sitting there hoarding all this stuff, like, you got to give – I give credit to guys like a Bill Gates, mm-hmm. who, yeah, he's got more money than God, but at the, uh, at the same time, he also is spending it out, and he's doing things with it to, to make things better. you get got uh, people like the Walden family that don't do anything. I mean, right. you've got billions upon billions of dollars. You don't need billions of dollars. When you die, it's going to go away. I mean, right. that's one of those reasons where I – like. Myself, I would absolutely love to be able to make enough money to be a philanthropist. Like that's my that's one of my sure. dreams in life to make things better. You know, to have an appreciation for it. we were bringing things back full circle, like the Highland Theater. I would absolutely love to to be involved in projects and stuff like that, and to celebrate the arts, and because that's what keeps your gro- a society growing and uh, takes us to the next level. You, you teach the young people of America how. You know the importance of this, and they get their creative juices flowing, and then we all grow. Maybe one day, you know, we'll have holodecks and warp drive speed. Uh, it, fighting and bickering, and you know, well, you're a red team, you're a blue team. You know, um, it's so dumb. It's it's the dumbing down of mm-hmm. of not just America, of the world. Really, it's like I was uh, told friends of mine. I actually want to get a T-shirt made that says racism. It's funny if you think about it. <laughs> Because it really is. Racism is what it's so hilarious and people get so offended by it, like, you know, oh I hate racism. It's you should laugh at it. It's like I could think of a hundred different reasons not to like someone other than beyond like, you know, oh, your skin color is this. Okay, great. Your hair color is this. It's the dumbest thing ever. And it's like the fact that it's gone on and it still exists to this day on both sides. You know, you have uh, it it's Pride, I love how it's ethnic culture or whatever, mm-hmm. like pride in your culture, but it's still racism, and it's so right. dumb. It's like when I'm dictator, first thing I'm doing is just abolishing all borders. We're just yeah. going to be people. Well, you know what? <laughs> and I learned I, – I like to learn lessons from the media. I learned during the last presidential campaign, if you're a black person and you're voting for Obama because he's black, that's not racism. See, I always thought if you vote for somebody or against somebody just on the basis of skin color, it was racism. So that was a useful lesson. Thank you, media. You told me it's not racism if a black person votes for Obama because he's black. Does it work if they're a Mexican? Uh, I Is don't it just know. just a minority That could be kind of a sensitive thing here. Yeah, oh, okay. that, could, that could be a sensitive issue there. But no. That's, a, that's, another, that's another group, too. That's that, growing yeah. up the Hispanic population. God bless them. They, they are. They're, I, 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 I've always been. I think Spanish women are sexy. So. They're, they're making great. <laughs> 
<laughs> I got that rice and beans working, Heck buddy. Yeah, Selma Hayek, man. Selma Hayek. You know, anything, any any chance I can uh, hang out with her? If well, you're listening, Selma, that call would, me. That would, be, that would be awesome. Give him a call. I like how you brought everything full circle. That's, that's a good place to go with it here. The whole thing of tiling it back to the Highland Theater and everything that you did with localism and everything. That's a lot of what I've been reading in some of, some of the PaleoCon publications and websites that I go to. That This is a thing for, I think, the future. And that as we go along, obviously with means of delivery, things are getting more centralized. But an emphasis on local type things is very healthy, and it's a good thing to be able to pass down to the next couple generations because it is getting to be kind of a bygone concept. I mean, and that's what our country was founded on. Was I mean, it started off with like the Jamestown plantations and stuff like that, and people. It started off that's how everything happens. That's how this city exists. That's how where you were at ex- exists. People came out the gold rush. Towns get built up and. Stuff happens as a result of it. We didn't just show up here all of a sudden and have a federal government with $3 trillion in debt. But uh, that's unfortunately where, where things have ended up. But it's going to take getting back to stuff like neighborhoods like Highland Square, which, quite frankly, I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. I love it here. I abs- This is home to me. This is home team. This is my home. I And I, I'm assuming people out there listening, you have your home team. You have mm-hmm. where you're at and where you'll stand up for, what you'll defend. And I, I go outside here. I know everybody out here. I can't get into the heck. We'll go for walk around the neighborhood in a minute you'll see like it's just it, you don't have a lot of that anymore where pe- people especially like you know uh suburbanites out there people that don't even talk to their neighbors anymore mm-hmm. i mean kids can't, when i was a kid you open up the front door go play all day come back at dark i don't do that anymore you can't i'm surprised they still have trick-or-treat now right afraid of everybody like poisoning everybody and you know it's just we need to like go back to the way things were, and I hate to say that. I feel like I'm an old man, and I'm like I'm talking about like the '80s. Yeah, <laughs> That's not that long ago, <laughs> the '80s and '90s. I mean, uh, it's kind of interesting. But we were very fortunate, though, in the fact that we grew up in the pre-9/11 era. Yeah, and 9/11 changed a lot of stuff, and it's still changing, and it's constantly changing. And it's one of those I don't necessarily know if it's uh, this might be a controversial statement, but I really don't care. It's one of those where you look at. What the reasonings for what happened was they were mad at us. The terrorists were mad about, you know, the certain freedoms we had. And then they took the the, the people who gave us our freedoms, took a lot of those freedoms away. So in reality, it's like you're giving them what they wanted and you don't even in the name of safety. And that's one of those things you mentioned what disgust you. That disgusts me by the fact that we have all like my goal that I want before I'm dead, which would make me this the happiest person in the world. I want to walk with my shoes on. To an airplane. I don't want to take my shoes off. I'm sorry. That's inconvenient to me. I don't like it. And the fact that, okay, one guy was a shoe bomber. Mm -hmm. So now because your people can't do your job, everybody else has to suffer. That's like going back to, like, the mentality of children. Um, You know, little Ricky was talking in class. Now nobody gets to go to recess. Right. Well, that's one of the challenges here, too, you know, of some of these explosives that people are hiding god willing the technology will continue to evolve to where you know a general wand type thing will suffice i'd I'd like to think that that will come at some point my thing too you want to figure i also want to figure out like why do you why why do you want to blow up an airplane what what, why would you want to do that i mean i mean obviously some people are just fanatical crazy nutcases but like what are you what are you hoping to prove where in your head does this cover off? This is a good idea. Right. Good things will come from this. That's just stupid. It's like, why can't we just do it like uh, Escape from New York style or Escape from L.A.? <laughs> just fine. Go on an island. Seriously, you guys want to do dumb stuff like that? Go have fun. Leave well, us alone. That, that would be tremendous. I, I would uh, I would spring for the boat uh, to uh, take them there. But, uh, you know, we, we've covered a whole lot of stuff uh, here, Jake. We started with one podcast uh, that we ended up uh, doing here on uh, the Movie Warrior and ended up getting a second one here on pro wrestling current events and other type things as well here so uh, i want to thank you so much for uh, for everything and everything that you got going on here i know now with jake digman.com j-a-k-e-d-i-g-m-a-n it's a work com. in progress that's your that's your hub you got your stuff going on there but anything and everything you want to plug my man go ahead and take it away um you know what right now i mean first and foremost everybody out there has supported the movie make sure you go uh, if you haven't seen it yet, go check out the movie Warrior. We were talking earlier about uh, you know being the underdogs and uh, things uh, of this country and how it was founded on. And you know what? The, this is perfect for that. It is an underdog movie that's giving it one heck of pardon the pun, but it's giving it a heck of a fight. So if you haven't seen it, go out, make sure you go out and check out the movie Warrior. Uh, you mentioned the website jakedigman dot com. Right now, I'm just kind of uh, I'm seeing where the next facet of where life's going to take me. We talked earlier. Uh, I have so many things I want to do. 
Um, I, I want to get involved in writing. I've got the various different writing projects that I am working on right now that uh, I love being creative. And that, that's, that's my outlet. And I, th- I encourage everybody out there to be creative and to follow your dr- pursue the dream, chase the dream, have faith. Whatever it may be, whatever you want to do, you can do it. You can make things happen. And anybody who tells you that you can't is just a pessimist and they're wrong because they failed. And they're afraid to get off their ass and make it happen. Make dreams happen. Uh, I heard a great piece of advice from a, a mentor of mine who has actually showed up to the, uh, to, to the opening night party at the movie. It was really cool to have him there. It was like you learn in your 30s, you earn your 40s, and you live in your 50s. I said, what about your 20s? He goes, have fun. <laughs> and me, I'm about to turn 30 years old, and I've done so much stuff in my 20s that now it's just a matter of getting together with uh, creative minds like yourself, with uh, people that are um, uh, other creative minds are, that are, I've surrounded myself with. You're only as good as the people you surround yourself with. So, I mean, if you want to be dumb, hang out with dumb people. But yeah. if you want to take things to the next level, don't be afraid to make your voice heard. To stand up and make a difference. It's funny segueing everything back. We mentioned the CM Punk. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to stand up. Have your voice heard. Get out there because you know what? Ideas are a dime a dozen. It takes action to make things happen. So that's that's kind of really. I don't really have anything to plug per se, other than make sure you go check out the movie. Uh, to international listeners, it'll be in theaters on September 21st. Uh, there's a huge buzz going on already over there. Um, everybody here is in theaters now. You won't regret it. I guarantee you. You'll come back and you'll be. You'll send an email to to Ricky and you'll be like, "Hey, I'm glad I listened to that episode and I'm glad I saw that. That really was a good movie." Yeah. Well, I, I hope it can only be a good uh, promotion for it. That's what we were going for. But uh, Jake, I know anytime we get a chance to sit down, uh, we're always going to hit a lot of fun stuff and it'll be uh, some great conversation. Thank you so much, my man. This has been a great, not just one as we started it, but now two many episodes of the FDH Lounge. I had a blast, Rick. Thanks for coming down to Highland Square. We'll do it again sometime soon. Thanks, pal.